Welcome to today's webinar, The Road to Driverless, Autonomous Vehicle Platform Sensors and Requirements, brought to you by GPS World Magazine and our sponsor, NAVCOM. I'm Diane Safranek from North Coast Media, publisher of GPS World Magazine, and I will be your event manager. Before we get started, I want to let you know that today's webinar will be recorded. You are currently in a listen-only mode. A recording of this webinar will be posted to gpsworld.com slash webinars and will be emailed to you tomorrow. At this time, I'd like to acquaint you with the ways in which you can participate during today's presentation. Please notice the Submit button in the lower left-hand corner of your console. Just type in the text box at the bottom left, then click Submit to place your question in queue. We encourage you to ask questions throughout the presentation. Our Twitter feed is placed in the upper right corner of your screen. You also may use the hashtag GPSWorldWebinar to submit any questions during today's webinar or to enter into discussions with other attendees. You may learn more about our speakers by viewing their photos and bios in the upper left-hand corner. If you would like a copy of today's presentation, Click on the green Downloads folder in the dock at the bottom of your screen. If you are logged into your social media accounts, you can share the webinar's title, description, and URL with your friends or colleagues on popular social media sites, all within the Share This widget at the top right. If you aren't already a GPS World Magazine subscriber, we'd like to invite you to sign up for today for free. All you have to do is click on the GPS logo in the dock at the bottom of your screen and fill out a short form. Finally, if you experience any technical difficulties during today's event, select Help to submit your issue and Assistant Producer Bethany Chambers or I will personally assist you. Now I'd like to turn today's event over to our moderator, editor and publisher of GPS World and Geospatial Solutions, Alan Cameron. Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, as the case may be, and welcome to the webinar. Uh, I'm Alan Cameron, publisher and editor of GPS World and Geospatial Solutions, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to the, uh, this version of the Road to Driverless. We had a cover story in this month's magazine. Uh, on the road to driverless technology. And with us today is one of the authors of that cover story, along with a couple of his colleagues. And they're going to cover a variety of aspects. I'm going, just going to show you the, uh, briefly show you the agenda now. John Fisher from Spectrecom is going to talk about the background to ADAS, that's assisted, uh, autonomous driver assisted system. I've, I've got it wrong, but, but John will set me straight. At any rate, it, they are driverless technologies and the driverless car. Uh, he's going to talk about some test track lessons from some military UAV testing that Spectrecom participated in. Uh, his colleague, Lisa Perdue, is going to talk about GNSS testing for automotive applications. And then uh, Hiro Sasaki is going to talk about real-time vehicle-to-vehicle testing considerations. Uh, before we get started, I want to let you know that there will be time at the end of the uh, webinar. Uh, after about three quarters of an hour, we'll switch to questions from the audience. Some of these have come in from you before uh, before the webinar, when you registered, and there is the facility, uh, as Diane explained, to pose questions via your webinar interface. We will also be asking questions of you during the webinar. At, at strategic points, I'll step in and, and push out a poll question to you just to get an idea of, of who's in the audience, what your level of interest, and, and, uh, or what your particular interests are. And uh, then we'll collect those responses. You'll, you'll respond via your webinar interface, and we'll show those results to you as well. Uh, finally, before we get started, before I turn it over to John Fisher, I want to just thank our sponsor, our webinar sponsor for the year, NAVCOM Technology. And as it turns out, NAVCOM also has a significant initiative underway in uh, unmanned autonomous systems. To get more information about this, you can uh, click on that link uh, after the webinar. It'll take you to a brief video 
uh, with uh, with a NAVCOM a technologist uh, that we recorded at AUVSI in Atlanta last month. And you can also go directly to NAVCOM's website for information about their Starfire technology. Now I'll turn the floor over to John Fisher, Chief Technology Officer from Spectracom. He will do two sets of presentations. I'll be back midway through his uh, set to pose the first survey question. But right now, John, it's over to you. The floor is yours. Thank you, Alan, and uh, thank you, everyone, for attending. Um, I'm here today to talk to you about the road to driverless and to share with you some of our experiences related to testing and evaluation. So um, the um, first, though, I'd like to just a uh, few words about uh, who we are. Um, we're Spectracom. We simplify the integration of position, navigation, and timing technology for our customers. So. We, we don't make GNSS receivers, but we make many of the things that go around them. We work in, in two main areas, military aerospace systems, of which I'll sh share some experiences with you there, but then also we call high-end commercial uh, applications. So anywhere where someone has a, a critical operation which depends on uh, GNSS systems and signals. We're a, uh, we're a global organization with a multi-domestic strategy, a um, little over 100 employees in, in six different countries. So we, we work quite globally. So um, I'll, uh, uh, um, Alan already gave you the agenda and of what we're going to do, so I'll, I'll get right to it. We'll, um, um, I'll first start with just uh, where we are today. We're in what we call the Advanced Driver Assisted Systems, ADAS systems. Um, some of you, if you drive a, a very nice car, you might be familiar with some of these, um, but uh, a number of them are moving into the mainstream. Most cars already have anti-lock brake systems or anti-slip traction control. Um, some of the newer features coming out of lane departure warning systems, speed assistance, autonomous braking, things to make you safer, uh, things for convenience of, of automatic parking or, or, or uh, items like that. And, and now starting with even some of the more, um, I'll call the more active, uh, active things of, of uh, taking over the car, braking for you to avoid obstacles, avoid pedestrians, or to, to um, uh, wake up the driver in case uh, the driver's not... Um, uh, not uh, uh, paying attention enough. So those are that's kind of where we are at today. And um, uh, but so now, what's the next step? We'll um, we're going into uh, the driverless car. So uh, the kind of a technology that's going to be onto the car for navigation. Um, it's going to be. It seems to be like a mix of items: um, radar and proximity sensing equipment. Uh, optical vision systems, and then of course the GNSS navigation system, of which they're all tied together and combined with with um, map matching. There probably will be other sensors involved in this, but these are the main ones in what we're seeing of the experimental driverless cars today. Um, a, a number of you folks uh, in your questions had uh, asking a lot about. Um, um, the uh, uh, regulations and the adoption and where things will go. Um, we are uh, uh, we're here at Spectrum. We're technologists. I'm going to focus on the technology uh, development and where that's going. Uh, but of course, technology development doesn't happen in a vacuum. So there will be all the uh, uh, regulatory issues that'll happen. Again, uh, when will we trust? Uh, trust to let go of the wheel, the human letting go of the wheel, and the driver taking over. This is the the big concern, and so that's where I think as as technologists we're looking about. Okay, we, we have to qualify the technology, test it, and, and show that out. So um, I've listed here a number of the regulations that are going on 
right now. Uh, the more, expect many more to come, but in the various countries of what's happening, uh, in particular, when uh, Lisa will uh, describe some of the testing, she'll focus a bit on eCall, uh, eCall 112 in Europe of what's going on there. So we'll, we'll, we'll touch on at least what type of qualification tests are needed for meeting those, those things there. But expect more activity and more legislation to be coming, um, uh, coming very soon. So um, how, do we, how do we qualify it? Of course, is, you have a choice, testing on the open road or testing on a test track. And of course, the answer is you need to do both. So uh, the, you may be familiar, it's been in the news quite a bit of what um, Mercedes, what uh, Google has been doing, even now Tesla with their new cars, with autopilot, what they're doing in that uh, some of the regulations are allowing on the open road uh, to some limited uh, ability to uh, let these vehicles be tested on the open road. Um, but the, the place where uh, uh, really has to happen first is over on a closed private circuit test track and that. And so there is where you need qualification tools to really calibrate the performance and improve out uh, where things are going. So um, that is the lead in of where we're going to share our lessons from testing UAVs, uh, uh, which are, when you think about it, are really very similar to a driverless car. So, um, uh, so but before I do that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Alan, which I believe he'll be doing the first survey question. Right. Thank you, John. Uh, our first survey question is going out to you, the audience, and despite John's comment just now about we are technologists, or the, the, the webinar speakers uh, from Spectrum are technologists and can't really comment on societal uh, aspects of this because uh, it's not their specialty, we still want to know what you think about the societal aspects of driverless car technology. What do you think will be the primary factor for the driverless car to gain acceptance in society? Will it be safety? Will it be convenience? Will it be economic benefits? I've seen some predictions that uh, there will, it will cut uh, gas consumption. Uh, will it be freeing up of time for reading on your commute? Will it be peace of mind for parents of teenagers or elderly drivers, uh, or could it be some other factor? We'd like you to uh, check one of those boxes, one of those buttons, and submit your answer, and we'll return with the audience results uh, after the next aspect of John's presentation. John, back to you. Great. Thank you, Alan. So um, what I'd like to do now is share with you our lessons from doing similar qualification testing for, uh, for UAVs. Um, the, uh, if I uh, list, I'll start out with what the need is, the need where you need to obtain accurate position and velocity data from the vehicle you're testing. During those trials, you need to measure the performance, and you need to do it during all phases of the exercise. So if it was a flight test during all phases of the flight in, in the automotive situation through all parts of the test course. Uh, so I've put up here uh, of uh, just a, I'll say, uh, uh, target requirements. Um, situations may change depending on each, uh, each uh, specific situation of what's being tested or what regulation you be looking to uh, meet, but in general, uh, we find that you need uh, centimeter level accuracy, and I'll start with 10 centimeter position accuracy uh, at all times through the phases of the test, speeds up to 200 kilometers per hour, and um, it, like with, with any type of, of instrumentation, having something to be reasonable cost. Um, is is important. So the the what we're focused on. There's I guess there's a number of ways to do this. Uh, you could instrument a test track with 
all kinds of sensors or positioning things there. What we focus on is where you instrument the vehicle and determining what the vehicle's position is um, and not instrument the, the track itself. It's usually a more affordable uh, way and allows you to uh, also use the same test techniques as you move to different tracks. There's all weather, uh, different climates, uh, different, um, uh, different tracks as you go. So, um, uh, but the, the important aspect, and again, as we touched on the, the, the legislation and the, and, and the laws that will be there, is a lot of this testing will be used uh, for, for legally traceable results. And so um, that will be another factor. Sometimes you have to make sure that, that all of this calibrated performance position gathering that you're doing is irrefutable and so that it has a maybe even a higher level of accuracy than what you would say from just a scientific point of view. So, um, so let me start in. And here's what we had evaluated over our periods of time of uh, uh, starting with just a simple GPS receiver using the standard positioning service, kind of the GPS receiver that's in most cars today, um, and then uh, adding different combinations of using a inertial measurement system uh, and other types of receivers, re single frequency, dual frequency, using differential GPS and non-differential, so a number of combinations. So as we go up, I'll cover each one of these five cases and uh, showing with the increasing accuracy. So as I go to our first case, as would probably be expected, that um, a simple GPS receiver alone will not give you the uh, accuracy you would need. Uh, as we show, our, our uh, experiments had showed a 46 meter one sigma error and peaks of several hundred meters of error. Now, let me point out that uh, you'd expect GPS receivers to do better than this, but this includes uh, the drift during periods of, of extended uh, many seconds of fading in that. And so under all even, you're dealing with a lot of adverse conditions, a lot of multipath. So um, uh, the, the next step is a hybrid system of where you, you add an IMU, an inertial measurement unit, to really carry you through those um, those fades. So if I go to that one, we now see that now we get into the range of a of a one sigma error of of a couple meters peaks, uh, less than 10 meters. So at least approaching something a little more uh, usable, but still not not probably acceptable. Um, I will point out that I will not go over uh, the in deep detail because we just have just an hour to share with you today, but that the, this um, this presentation is really a summary of what was presented at the uh, uh, European Navigation Conference back in April. So you can refer to the nice paper uh, presented there. Um, or also, if you're interested in more details, uh, please contact us directly. Our, our emails will be are, are part of this, this presentation. So again, won't go over a lot of these graphs in detail, um, but just give you a highlight of where, we, where, where it stands. So the next level of accuracy you can achieve is um, uh, using differential GPS. So still having a, an IMU married with a GPS receiver, still a single frequency commercial receiver, but um, using differential mode. So in a differential mode, you have a uh, reference uh, receiver, a static, typically static reference receiver, one or more, but even these experiments w would show the results with just one single reference receiver, uh, which can be up to 100 kilometers away. So the analysis here is with um, with things being um, being about 100 kilometers away. Um, the uh, so now we look and we see that our one sigma error terms get into 20, 21 centimeters. The peaks 
um, just uh, one and a half uh, meter, so not too bad. Uh, gets a little better differential taking out a, a, a good part of that error. Next case would be where I use um, the differential mode, but with dual frequency. So now we're using both the L1 and L2 of of the uh, the GPS system with carrier phase. But to point out that this is still these are commercial receivers, not the military. Even though you're using the the uh, uh, phase tracking the L2 military signal, it's still with a commercial receiver that is just, just only doing phase tracking of the precise positioning signal. And so this is commercially available. These are the types of receivers that are used in uh, the surveying construction industry that do that. So now as we see our, our errors, a one sigma era of, of um, 18 centimeters, our peaks are below peak errors, worst case peak errors are below a meter. So this could be uh, maybe useful in performance test track uh, work. So um, the, the last case is where we go to, um, go to uh, the, a dual frequency receiver differential mode but also now using a high-end inertial uh, measurement unit. So all the previous cases I was showing was using with an affordable MEMS-based um, IMU. Um, this is now uh, a high-end, but still a commercially available uh, high-end. In fact, it is the, the, the one uh, used here, the KVH 1750, and these experiments were the the ones of the the pretty much the highest performance you can get in a non-military uh, ITAR exportable uh, situation. So um, what we have here, we've also this experiment is uh, working with um, the uh, from our friends at Geodetics of their uh, special um, Epic by Epic software that does the Kalman filtering and provides a uh, very high dynamic in uh, combination of, of good filtering yet high dynamic trade-off in the, in the uh, Kalman estimation, position estimation algorithm. So um, the results of these experiments I will show to you now. No, I will first show you what the equipment looks like. So an external IMU, a, uh, a G, of course, a, this type of GPS antenna, and uh, the geodetics um, processing. So now I will show you, as now, now we see that we can get um, on, on a one sigma better than centimeter level accuracy, even our peaks are down into a couple centimeters and um, quite, quite accurate. So um, uh, excellent results, a bit more expensive, but still within that, um, uh, at least the affordability parameters of which I had outlined earlier. So um, the summary here being that um, uh, you can achieve high performance in, um, in, and these are real time, high dynamic, you're gathering data in real time. Um, the, the, the highest performance that I showed was over, just over a six kilometer baseline, but uh, you get a fairly good performance over up to a hundred kilometer baseline. Baseline being the distance between your vehicle and your differential reference receiver. So, um, and that the uh, using, getting this super high performance using a fiber optic gyro uh, of these uh, things there that allow you to get uh, centimeter level accuracy uh, even in periods, extended periods of, of where you need to do dead reckoning and work with uh, no GPS signal. So, um, uh, that's just the, a summary of our experiences of things that were done in the UAV world that would apply to you folks. And I guess I'm going to turn it over to uh, Alan again for the next segment. Yeah, thank you, John. I'll just be with uh, our audience briefly. Diane, let's see the results of that first poll. What do you think will be the primary factor for the driverless car to gain acceptance in society? 
And we can see that the overwhelming majority of you think that safety will be the primary factor. Now, this is, um, I guess the question was a little bit open-ended um, because I'm, I'm sure that judging from the questions that are coming in from our expert audience and certainly from what you can gather from the media, there are a lot of questions about the safety of driverless technology and what happens if this and what happens if that. But uh, it seems that the uh, vast majority of you out there think that safety will be the primary factor to gain acceptance. A somewhat lesser amount of votes, uh, about a fifth of you think that convenience will be key. Uh, economic benefits do not seem to gather too much support, freeing up of time a little bit more and that pretty much covers it. We're going to go now to the second poll question we're going to ask you to vote on or, or to give us your opinion on, and that is what type of advanced driver assistance systems component testing is most important to you today? Your choices are standalone GNSS navigation equipment, eCall or the GLONASS version ERA, uh, radar systems, vehicle-to-vehicle uh, -vehicle communications, or some other component testing. What type of ADAS component testing is most important to you today? Uh, we'll return with your answers to that after the next segment of our presentation. And for that, we'll go back to John. Or no, we'll go back to, uh, we'll go to uh, Lisa, Lisa Purdue from Spectrecom. Hey, thanks, Alan. This segment will be about GNSS testing for automotive applications. And I'll just open by saying, so far, John has given us a great introduction to advanced driver-assisted systems and why signal frequency commercial systems are not enough to validate an ADAS system on a test track. But what about the navigation system in the vehicle? Usually, it is a single frequency commercial GNSS system combined with other sensors. How do we test and validate those? But before we talk about all these sensors and navigation systems today, I want to take a quick step back in time and ask, do you rem remember these? So it used to be that when we would go on a road trip, especially when I was younger, it was important that we had an atlas with us or multiple folding maps of the different areas that we were going to visit. As I got older, we used the available technology and printed driving directions from MapQuest or Yahoo. It was pretty amazing, yet I could still never figure out if the distance listed next to a point meant the distance to the next point or the distance from the last point. So let's just say I perfected my U-turn early on in life. And then finally, at some point in the mid-2000s, it was practical and it was affordable for most people to have a GPS navigation system in their cars. So while luxury cars did offer built-in navigation systems early on, for most of us, having a navigation system in the vehicle met one of these, a handheld or mounted GPS navigation unit that was not part of the vehicle. It was pretty great. I could know when a turn was coming up, and I'm sure I violated fewer local driving laws when I was using one of these versus using the driving directions printed from MapQuest or Google. But testing these systems was pretty simple too. All we needed was a GPS simulator. They are, after all, standalone devices and were not tied in with the vehicle navigation system. GPS simulators can be programmed to follow a route that is the same as the receiver is programmed to be and also to deviate from that route. All standard receiver tests, time to first fix, sensitivity, and perfect and poor environments can be performed from a single simulator. But what we have today is more like this situation. GNSS is part of the in-vehicle navigation system, along with other sensors, including an IMU. Today's vehicle can also receive network data, like assisted GNSS, and traffic information. It also uses map matching to improve the location accuracy coming from GPS. 
Automakers are also preparing for eCall and ERA GLONASS by adding in-vehicle systems to support these upcoming regulations. And I will talk about that in more detail in a couple of slides. But first, how do we test these integrated sensor systems today? Well, we can still use a GNSS simulator. They can typically provide more information, more test data than just the GNSS RF. They can provide other navigation data as well. Data from the onboard sensors, including IMU, accelerometer, gyroscope, and odometer, can be simulated from a single simulator. But what about the other vehicle sensors? We can also use a simulator as part of a hardware in the loop simulation. In a hardware in the loop setup, real time vehicle behavior is simulated using software and hardware models. Real sensors are connected to the simulated environment for test. The GNSS simulator is one of the real time simulation tools that is used to test the GNSS sensor. We really have a, a bigger system where a simulator becomes a component of that system. So we can really fully test the entire integrated sensor system in a vehicle. And as promised, some more information about eCall and Aeroglonus. So eCall is the European initiative, and Aeroglonus is the Russian. But they are created with the same goal in mind. If a vehicle is equipped with an in-vehicle system, or IVS, then in the event of a serious accident, which can be triggered by even more vehicle sensors, such as airbag sensors, the system automatically makes the 112 call. Call is answered by the nearest public safety answering point, or PSAP. Data is transmitted, and two-way voice communications are enabled. This IVS is built into the vehicle and does not use a connected cell phone to make the call. This is different than some of the systems that are installed today in vehicles that require a separate mobile phone is pre-connected to the system before the accident occurs. But there is a difficulty here when it comes to the positioning. The position transmitted by the vehicle is taken from GNSS. When the accident occurs, the last position recorded is transmitted. There is still discussion on what the accuracy of that position must be. For example, if the goal is to set 20 meter accuracy and the GNSS position is updated only once per second, then a vehicle moving at 30 meters per second may have an error greater than 20 meters when the accident occurs especially if the GNSS reception is unavailable due to the accident. So this topic is still open and still under discussion. But what we do know about the regulations is that EU Regulation 2015-758 was approved and released on April 29th of this year. Effective March 31st, 2018, the regulation requires all new vehicles must be fitted with an e-call in-vehicle system. So we need to test these in-vehicle systems that are being developed now for those cars. So this is an example of a connected car test system. This is an Enritsu system designed to test the communications and positioning in the connected car. So this system su fully supports testing the compliance to new regulations for in-vehicle automated emergency response and the regulations for eCall and Aeroglonass. Here's another picture of the actual system. It's on display at Mobile World Congress 2015. It is a cloud-based fleet management system developed by Enritsu and the University of Hertfordshire with support from Spectrocom for the positioning parts. An onboard device simulator provides data about speed, engine status, fuel consumption, and GNSS-based position to a cloud server over LTE. It is a complete test environment that supports that supports any global location, any GNSS system, and any type of cellular connectivity. So the pieces we see here in this test setup are in Ritsu's MD8475A network simulator and Spectrocom's GSG6 GNSS simulator. So as we move from standalone navigation systems to the hybrid in-vehicle systems, we also move away from the standalone tester 
for its hybrid test systems that are flexible enough to support the sensors you need to test when you need to test them. So that concludes my part of the presentation, and now I'll throw it back over to you, Alan. Thank you, Lisa. We're going to pause briefly before we return to the presentations. We're going to uh, sh revisit or yes, revisit survey question number two. Diane, let's see the results of that poll. And in that poll, we asked you, our audience, what type of ADOS component testing is most important to you today? And we see that almost half of you are uh, find most important standalone GNSS navigation equipment testing. A third, almost exactly a third of our audience, is most interested in vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communications and much smaller percentages in the other answers. We will turn now to the third survey question, the third and last survey question that will ask you to give us your opinion. Well, uh, not opinion in this case, uh, but your, uh, we, we want to know about your primary job function. Uh, can you tell us if you, and go, let's go ahead and push that uh, survey out to the audience, Diane. Uh, what's your primary job function? The options are I specify, design, or integrate automotive navigation or ADAS systems or components, or I test automotive navigation or ADAS systems or components, or I specify, design, or integrate navigation or autopilot systems or components for unmanned autonomous systems, or I test navigation or autopilot systems or components for UAS. And then there's the ever popular other category. Please uh, give us your answer to this, your primary job function. And while those results are coming in, we will hear next from Hironoro Sasaki, the Director of Solutions Architecture for Spectrecom. Hiro, take it away. Thanks, Alan. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, my name is Hiro Sasaki from Spectrecom. And the first thing I'd like to cover in my part of the presentation is to talk about this concept of what it means to be connected, what it means for the car to be connected. And we really see this as two pieces of the connectivity for the car. We see one side, the real-time connectivity for critical systems. And on the other side, we see non-real-time connectivity for non-critical systems or for user experience applications which Lisa talked a little about, about earlier in the presentation. And so the non-real-time applications can include anything from infotainment to internet connectivity to smartphone integration or searching for destinations and waypoints, um, anything including as well as vehicle maintenance and diagnostics or even remote access functions for the car. Now, even though these user experience applications may accelerate the adoption of driverless cars, they won't really play a large part in the autopiloting functions of the car. <clears throat> so for this section, I'm really gonna focus on the real-time connectivity challenges, specifically how real-time connectivity issues affect navigation and autopiloting functions for the car. And in this space, we're talking about milliseconds, where the reaction time on emergency braking, for example, could be life critical in that type of situation. Uh, comparing that with um, non-real-time applications, for example, loading your latest Facebook or Twitter feeds. Uh, though I, I must admit, if anybody has some teenagers out there, they might argue that those are also life critical, but for the purposes of the presentation, we'll focus on um, the real navigation aspect of real-time systems. So for these real-time navigation systems, I think we can all agree that GNSS by itself is insufficient, uh, not only because it's not accurate, um, but really because it's not guaranteed to always be available. Uh, and John talked about that a little bit in his presentation as well. Now we see issues with GNSS by itself where the low power, the low signal power is really susceptible to interference, whether this is intentional or unintentional interference. Uh, but also the availability of the signal when we're in situations where there's no access to the sky, direct line of sight to the sky, for example, in tunnels 
uh, parking garages, urban canyons, or uh, around city skyscrapers. Now, I think we've all been in that situation where we're navigating ourselves using Google Maps, and we see that circle of uncertainty in the Google Maps application, or, or we really just can't figure out where we are because we're not getting a good GPS signal. So now applying that to a situation where, where centimeter level accuracy is important, we really need to supplement the GNS system with additional information. So to mitigate the weaknesses of GNSS, uh, these driverless vehicle systems will really need to be a hybrid of many different technologies working together, uh, need to be complementary systems. So some systems may include optical or thermal vision systems to help with the perimeter surveillance. Uh, we might see different types of radars and proximity sensors and lasers to help with functions such as speed control or emergency braking, blind spot detection, or even pedestrian detection in the vicinity. Uh, we, we also address some of the inertial capabilities for supplementing navigation even in periods where there's no external sensors that can provide that information. Uh, we talked about map matching or even map correlation, correlating pre-existing information about the environment to figure out and determine where the car is, the vehicle is at any moment. And then additionally, we really want to also supplement the system with this concept of real-time networking. And the real-time networking is really where we get access to many more sensors that are distributed throughout the network. Um, so I think you know we talked about the some of the economic benefits uh, in one of the surveys potentially from driverless cars, but as a result of the survey, I think we all agree that safety is going to be a really important part of uh, pushing forward the adoption of the driverless car, and so we must make a driverless car that is safer than the equivalent human driver in order for it to be really fully accepted in society. And in order for that to be safer than a human, the navigation system must have high reliability and integrity. Again, to ensure that the system is safer, we must have high reliability and integrity in the system. Now this can only be achieved, again, utilizing many of the complementary sensors including access to a whole array of new sensors that are distributed throughout the network. Uh, now, Lisa earlier had talked about uh, integrated sensor systems, but now I'm going to focus a little bit more specifically on the real-time data networking aspect of the system. The real-time data network can be broadly described as a V2X network, which is comprised of V2V, vehicle-to-vehicle, and V2I, vehicle to infrastructure communication links. And now these communication links utilize DSRC, or dedicated short range communication protocols, which have been gaining uh, worldwide adoption along with IEEE 802.11p. Now V2X overall provides a few major enhancements to the driverless vehicle. The first aspect is that it is a real-time information network. And so that means we start to get access to the latest and greatest information that's available. We're able to capture the ever-evolving situation and environment around the car in real time. And we're able to include what's happening in the local surrounding of the car, but also to leverage information that might be beyond the line of sight of other sensors. So now we start to get advanced information coming from vehicles or assets or infrastructure that's beyond our, our standard vision. Second point, <clears throat> excuse me, we're able to coordinate uh, between vehicles in a, in a sense of providing cooperative navigation or even an early warning data system. And so for aspects like proximity detection, we can now start to even predict the proximity detection in addition to what the sensors located on the vehicle can see. And so in that way, we can predict potentially based on what other vehicles are seeing, what obstacles might be in our current vehicle's way. For braking, emergency braking, we can start to coordinate braking across multiple vehicle assets. And so as vehicles in front of us start to slow down, 
that system can automatically inform cars behind them to automatically slow down at the same rate. We can start to also control speed. So we talk about cruise control and energy efficiency. If we can manage speed control across multiple assets, we can really maximize the utilization of the roads and even potentially pack more vehicles onto a road with less congestion. Another aspect too is potentially weather hazards. We can start to lar use the infrastructure to provide large scale weather avoidance, um, avoiding a storm, avoiding uh, heavy rainfall, for example. Traffic management might be another aspect of that where we can start to reroute uh, cars based on congestion and we can start to improve the efficiency of the highway systems by just rerouting cars uh, um, to alleviate that congestion. And then also we can have uh, areas where we can provide zone control or speed control based on what's going on. So for example, in a construction zone, we might set up an area where it's a decreased um, speed zone, or we can provide the ability to set up alerts that allow vehicles to avoid areas that might be uh, challenging. And the third point there, finally, is the, the, this concept of crowdsource location. So as we build a network where we're able to um, connect with vehicles around us, we can supplement our, our own positioning information with information that's provided from other vehicles. So for example, if I don't know where I am, I can ask my neighboring vehicles where they are, and they can help me to determine where I am in relation to where they are. And so it's just another level of information assurance that we can use to improve the overall system. And in, in addition to that, we can start to use predictive intelligence. For example, in a situation where, let's say, um, there's a road hazard or a large puddle in the highway, for example, as cars in front of us begin to change their, um, change their speed or adjust their paths based on those conditions, that information can immediately and instantaneously be sent to cars behind to help with traffic flow congestion and improve the safety conditions of the overall experience. So we talked about all these very great benefits that we get from V2X, but a big question remains on how do we test and how do we validate them to really achieve and guarantee that they become safer than a human driver? And that's, that's still one of our main goals, to improve the safety. And so we have the opportunity here to, to utilize a lot of the testing frameworks that we talked about a little bit early in the presentation um, with Lisa and John, and leverage those to incorporate this additional sensor network, this sensor data network, and provide an integrated test suite for, for, for testing all the aspects of the driverless vehicle. The real-time testing, network testing, really requires expertise in both time precision measurements as well as multi-sensor integration, which we covered a little bit earlier in the presentation. Now, some of the unique considerations in, in this uh, section include uh, the first standalone performance, for example. We, we want to be able to measure lost packets, lost data packets on the DSRC network. We want to measure the latency in the network we want to measure the congestion or the capacity of these, these new V2X networks. But also we want to understand the interaction and the effects of those uh, individual standalone performance tests on the overall system. So we want to understand the impact of lost or late packets on the data network or the impact of bad information that's coming across the data network. Um, or even, again, understanding the impact of congestion on the data network and capacity constraints that we might, uh, we might see in the real life. And we want to understand how that affects the overall navigation problem. Further, we're going to want to understand uh, the fault tolerance of the system, measuring uh, what happens, for example, when the data network fails. If this is a critical part of the system, we need to make sure that we can uh, achieve still high reliability um, and integrity of the entire system, even when we lose one of these subsystems. And we want to understand also what happens and measure what happens to the other systems when we lose this data network. I think John had mentioned earlier about regulatory compliance. So another huge aspect there, 
in order to achieve um, adoption of driverless vehicles to make sure that we have a way to validate these systems or even certify new devices or new vehicles that are introduced into the networks. And finally, we, we also want to take into consideration this, the networking and data security aspects as well as the personal privacy aspects of introducing a very content-rich data network. And so we, we will want to test the vulnerabilities of the system, um, play out malicious attack scenarios, understand what happens when and how to avoid those situations, and make sure we have fail-safe solutions that can uh, mitigate those effects as a system, and also validate the fact that we're able to protect the personal information that might be contained in that network. For example, driving behaviors, regular routes, home location, work location. Those are the type of things that we're going to really want to protect. So I, I think overall, having a framework for testing these integrated systems, as well as having an expertise in time precision measuring, are really critical for proving that the driverless cars are, in fact, safer than human drivers and do have high reliability and integrity. That's all for me today. Uh, thank you again for your time, and uh, back to you, Alan. Thank you, Hero. I want to let our audience know we're, we're about 10 minutes away from the top of the hour, but we are going to go a little bit over. So if you can stay with us, we, we have time to answer several questions and to answer more questions. Uh, we're going to go a little bit past the hour. First, we're going to take a look at at you, the audience. And Diane, let's see the results of that third poll. In that third poll, we asked, what is your primary job function? Now, here we have other, the other category leading the pack. This is perhaps a reflection of this is really new technology. And although a lot of people are interested in it and uh, ready to jump into it or, or willing, want, wanting to investigate it, uh, you out there in our audience, relatively few of you are actually now active in it. But certainly this is uh, your, your attendance here is an indication of high interest. And I imagine if we took this same poll again in six months or a year, the numbers would be significantly different. But we have nearly four-fifths in the other category, about 10% specifying, designing, or integrating automotive navigation and ADAS, uh, a little bit less than that, specifying, designing, or integrating navigation for autopilot systems, and a small fraction uh, actually testing. We'll go now to your questions. And our first question uh, is one that John alluded to uh, and discussed briefly in the first part of his presentation, but I want to return uh, to that and give him a chance to expand upon it since it's of interest to the audience. And that is, the question is, will precision GNSS, such as RTK, real-time kinematic, or PPP, precise point positioning, play a role in ADOS? Will multi-frequency GNSS, such as uh, combined L1, L2C, L5, make its way into ADAS. John, you uh, talked briefly about multi-frequency GNSS. Uh, let, let's go back to that topic and, and give us your viewpoints. Yes, um, I, I did point out the um, advantage, the, the, the accuracy advantage of multi-frequency, at least L1, L2, but uh, I, I like this question and the fact that there are other aspects to multi-frequency, specifically for the, the GPS system, L2C, the civilian signal, which has now been specifically designed for civilian use and not for military use. And there are something like 16 or 17 satellites operating with this new, new signal. Uh, on the GPS system, so we're very close to achieving a full capability in the next couple years. And also the new L5 signal, which is in common also with the E5 of Galileo and very close to the Beidou systems uh, uh, thing. So uh, uh, multi-frequency in this case has um, a big advantage in uh, um, interference in jamming uh, avoidance. 
it's much harder. It's easy to jam one frequency. It's a little harder to jam two. It's even harder to jam three. So um, there's an advantage there. So to answer the question directly, I, I would say I, yes. I believe uh, it will make uh, multi-frequency uh, those advantages will make it uh, come into into the ADAS system. And uh, at least with L2C right now and uh, L5 very quickly to follow. And if I were to go to the first uh, uh, part of that question about uh, RTK, real-time kinematic uh, positioning, which is that uh, differential concept we discussed earlier, or um, the precise positioning system, PPP, again, using differential uh, features to do that. Um, the fact that you have a connected car, the fact that you have a data link to some of these fixed sites, yes, it should be very practical to do that. So on a, from a technology point of view, it's very doable and you'll get the, the uh, accuracy advantages of differential GPS. Um, but uh, I'm, I guess that's as far as I'll go in predicting of exactly how, though, it'll take shape because uh, worldwide and where it's doing, but I would say PT, PPP with its networking um, uh, capabilities, uh, would I, I would think shows the most promise there. All right, thank you, John. I, I forget at the moment if it was Yogi Berra or Mark Twain who said, predicting is hard, especially when it involves the future. But that's the business that we're in, uh, looking out into the future and trying to plot our way across an unknown landscape. Our second question, uh, Hero alluded to this, uh, talking about high integrity and, and high availability being critical. The question is, high integrity and high accuracy uh, is needed for ADAS. And, of course, we will add high availability as well. What is the role of local augmentation systems for exploiting the driverless cars market? Okay, thank you. Yes, a, a good, um, a good uh, question. The uh, local augmentation uh, system uh, is uh, being used in uh, the aircraft industry and um, uh, for like precision landing, using the GPS for precision landing. So I think... It, uh, this is only one person's opinion, but I think it'll have limited role here. I think because the, uh, any local augmentation system uh, requires a lot of equipment in a local area, that um, that uh, it'll uh, the infrastructure build out. When you think of how ubiquitous cars have to be, they have to be able to travel everywhere uh, on land. Um, so I think it's going to have limited availability. I would think that the PPP system, which you get m many of those same uh, same benefits, of course not as accurate as a local augmentation system, but I would think that would play a role first before, before uh, one of the uh, uh, local augmentation systems, like a, what they sometimes now refer to as a GBAS. So um, that would be my, my guess. Okay. Turning to the topic of V2X and specifically V2I, Hero talked about DSRC. Uh, a couple of, I'm, I'm going to lump a, a few questions from several people into uh, sort of a long, <clears throat> excuse me, long multiple question. Uh, will DSRC deployment change the GPS marketplace? When will traffic lights be integrated? With driverless cars, well, let's not say, let's not ask our our speakers when, but how does integration of of traffic control uh, figure in this driverless car concept? Uh, is vehicle navigation expected to be provided from a database and or a combination of sensors? Well, we've answered that yes. Uh, if a database is used, a database is used, would it not require continuous updating for construction, traffic, weather? and other road issues. That's a lot uh, all in one question, but if you can sort of address the uh, conglomerate infrastructure integration aspect, uh, if you would please, John or Hero. Yes, um, I, I would say that the uh, D, uh, DSRC will be a 
monumental change in the whole navigation. It has the ability to be that that real change in the whole uh, way of navigating with the car. It has a huge advantage, as we mentioned, having a network, a real-time network connection to um, uh, to any of the other vehicles, any of the other infrastructure around you, having that data connection, uh, there's a huge advantage there. So I think it's going to be a monumental change. Um, uh, will traffic lights be integrated? Yes, I, I, uh, um, I think so. I think that's a, it's a fairly simple, straightforward thing. Of course, as the, the, the folks asking these questions bring up, you know, there's, a, there's then the whole other end of, of okay, uh, database updates. How will we um, uh, how will we keep these databases updated? And so they will, like most things, it's uh, only as good as the data that you put into it. Only as much as you can control it. So uh, I think the the capability will be there. But then um, as you drive into different uh, parts of the world, different even parts within your own country, different uh, sectors, you'll, uh, you'll have a wide, wide range of quality and integrity of that data that you're talking to. And so the, the processing, onboard processing systems will need to be very robust and uh, very intelligent in how they use it. But that is the other big factor. We have, we have uh, the, our processing capability grows, as everyone knows, at Moore's Law uh, rate, and so uh, the kind of processing capability we even have today is there to, um, to handle this data intelligently uh, as it has this wide variety of, of, of integrity or staleness. All right. Uh, what about uh, in in the light of mentioning robustness, which you just did? Uh, there are two big concerns, big buzzwords, big things we read about in the paper uh, nearly every day, or or if, uh, if we're in the GNSS community in the pages of GPS World. What about in this in this environment? What about unintentional or intentional jamming? Uh, how does that play into the picture, and what can be done about it? And the other buzzword from the daily papers, hacking, what about if communications network, and, and presumably a lot of this is, is uh, well, obviously a lot of this is being done via the Internet, what about hacking uh, into the communications network, into the database? Great, great questions. And uh, I, I start with as far as uh, jamming. Uh, we, you know, we can acknowledge that there is both intentional and unintentional jamming, and we'd have to say that the, the, the biggest weakness with any GNS system is the weak signal, the fact that it is very easy to, to interfere and jam it, uh, whether intentionally or unintentional. Uh, we know, as we know, that people will buy illegal jammers on the internet that plug into your cars and and they're very cheap and very dangerous too. I guess I would admonish all of our listeners, please don't use them. They're not only illegal, they're very dangerous. They can undermine the GPS system. So um, uh, so I think what it goes to is that uh, uh, and what we were uh, alluding to in our presentation is that no, even an Current ADAS systems and no future driverless car can depend on GNSS alone. It will require other, uh, other things. And so um, uh, as far as security, uh, is now as we say we have a driverless car and that we're going to uh, be able to use external networking inputs. As we mentioned, we, I think a lot of us are, we saw in the um, in the survey response, a lot of us are thinking about how we deal with this new DSRC real-time network. Um, the, uh, it, it must be secure because now you have what I'll say is a, a, a car that can be driven by wire or driven remotely, even if it can be, uh, be driven by the processor and it has a network connection. Network connection could be taken over and uh, control of that vehicle could be taken over. So um, uh, security uh, is going to be, 
is the top thing there. Anything uh, that is going to be used in this driverless car must be secure. All the networking must be secure. And um, uh, although, uh, uh, so I, I'm going to leave it to the security experts to uh, to address how that's going to be done. But um, uh, it's a given that uh, it must be secure, uh, both from a say a uh, you know, being someone taking over and in 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 doing something malicious to the driverless car, but also uh, there's privacy issues, you know, of being, uh, many of us are concerned about uh, 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 being tracked of where we're going and, and how do we address that. And so we're, we're, a lot of that's being addressed in our smartphones today, the privacy issues, but I think they'll continue and uh, may not be able, you, again, each, I think each society, each country will form their own legislation uh, and, and how each one of our cultures deals with it. But I can only speculate that uh, some of the freedoms allowed with that you would expect in a pedestrian-based smartphone may not be able to be extended to, um, uh, it may have to be a bit more restrictive since you're in a vehicle and a vehicle which can, can do harm to others if not controlled properly. So. Uh, very, very good questions, but we probably don't have enough time to, to go into that. Right. Uh, I'm going to pose uh, one final question to our panel here, but first I'm going to give everybody out in the audience uh, a look at some email addresses to uh, you can address uh, some of your questions to subsequent to the webinar. We haven't had time to answer every question that's been submitted, but I have a record of those here, and I'm going to share them with our speakers after the fact, and we will probably return uh, in print, I think, in the magazine or in one of our email newsletters uh, to some more uh, to, to answering these questions in more detail. So stay tuned, and we'll get back to you with those. I'm going to uh, pose one final question, and it's a little bit out on the edge into the, uh, into the speculative future and, and certainly outside uh, perhaps our speaker's realm of expertise. But there's a lot of uh, questions about uh, in the scientific community and in the general public. What about the interaction between driverless and driver driven cars uh, what's the what's the vision for the future are the, are they going to be on the road together or will they be in separate lanes or separate roads completely uh, people have read about and have written in with questions about the the accidents that the google driverless vehicles have had uh, because of uh, human drivers are uh, ramming into them a well, accidents, let's just say, uh, between driver-driven and driverless cars. What's the, what's the vision uh, about this for the future going forward, John? Yes, uh, and, and as you point out, I'm not an expert uh, on this, so there's a lot uh, developing. I guess I'll make the observations that um, the real, um, that is the real challenge that uh, uh, we could, we would, if we had, if it was practical to do um, separate, uh, isolated of where driverless systems were separate, we would have them now. And in fact, I guess I will say that uh, I've been on uh, things, I've been on uh, uh, rail systems and things that are there, are, uh, it's robotic controlled uh, rail systems, at, uh, short range ones at airports and things. So we 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 do have um, uh, have some of that now. That's kind of the easier case to deal with with uh, the isolated things. And but I, I think we would have them today if they were practical to build them. So I don't think that's where the future is going to be. Um, I think the interaction between driverless cars and other driverless cars is very easy. That's a protocol you can set up uh, very easy. So that will be the easy, trivial case. It will be the interaction between the driverless and the human cars. But for this to be, uh, uh, again, the practical considerations, uh, the, the driverless car must 
interact with human drivers. We will not be able to switch overnight into a driverless system. Uh, and I think most people, and I'll, just an observation, I think most of the uh, at least forward thinkers uh, uh, think that it is possible that we have the we have the uh, sensing capability in the hardware, we have the processing capability in the software to do this, and so um, we uh, um, at least I for one believe it is quite possible and look forward to a, a pretty interesting future here. I can't wait for a I can't wait for this first uh, driverless car to ride in. I'm sure many of us share that uh, share that uh, anticipation. Uh, thank you, John, for your contribution to this program, and thank you to all three of our speakers from Spectrecom, John Fisher, Lisa Perdue, and Hiro Sasaki. Thanks to you, our audience, for attending. Uh, people stayed uh, well over the hour, evidence of the interest in this topic. Finally, I'd like to thank our sponsor of this webinar series, NAVCOM Technology. And again, if you want a brief glimpse into what they're doing in the unmanned autonomous systems sphere or segment, you can go to gpsworld.com slash NAVCOMUAS for a, for a brief glimpse. It's about a minute and a half talk by Jim Williams there. And you can take a look at their Starfire technology, navcomtech.com slash starfire. Uh, this is Alan Cameron from GPS World. Thank you again for attending this webinar. We'll have another one in July. It's always the third Thursday of the month. Keep your eyes out for announcements on the website in our various newsletters. Our webinar on July 16th will involve uh, geospatial uh, technology, geosp uh, mapping, and specifically navigating in urban canyons with uh, the aid of map matching and, uh, and 3D building models. That's the topic of our July cover story in the magazine. will also be the topic of our July webinar. Uh, once again, thank you for attending, and goodbye until next time. This is GPS World and the GPS World webinars. Back to you, Diane. Thank you for attending the Road to Driverless Autonomous Vehicle Platform Sensors and Requirements webinar presented by GPS World and by our sponsor, NAVCOM. A recording of this webinar will be posted on the GPS World website and will be emailed to you tomorrow. Thank you for attending and enjoy your day.